Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors. And today I have Michael Arnold here from Pima Heart and Vascular. I want to share with you, he's gonna actually talk to us today about the connection between atrial fibrillation and stroke. Um, Mike, it, Dr. Arnold is an electrophysiology nurse practitioner with Pima Heart and Vascular. And he worked as a nurse in cardiology and the cardiac cath lab for 10 years before earning his doctorate in, in nursing practice at the University of Arizona. Um, he is board certified in cardiac arrhythmia, electrophysiology, um, cardiovascular disease and family practice. And his clinical practice includes management of arrhythmia, pacemakers and defibrillators, along with a special interest in device therapies for congestive heart failure. So he has an extensive ex electrophysiology experience and that's allowed him to travel across the country as an expert in heart rhythm mapping and he trains physicians and staff in new techniques and technology. So welcome, Michael. Hi, right, thank you. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and let you jump into your presentation here. Great. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Michael Arnold. Uh, we're going to talk about the connection between atrial fibrillation and stroke. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, if you kind of already went over, it's enough about me. But, uh, <laughs> I have no uh, disclosures regards to AFib, but we'll talk uh, kind of a little bit. I want to lay out a roadmap of what the uh, approach would be. One is to talk about stroke, which um, has been around for a long time, but uh, defining it um, has eluded people for a while as far as what exactly it is. And then um, looking at the role of atrial fibrillation and how that contributes to strokes. Um, and then what can we do to try to prevent atrial fibrillation from causing future strokes and what future uh, opportunities are available for us now. So uh, a stroke, the medical term that we use is cerebrovascular accident. And that actually has two types. Uh, the, the primary one is a hemorrhage into the brain or the skull. You can see on this uh, MRI image here. The other is what's called an ischemic stroke, and that's reduction of blood flow to the area of the brain. So generally that can be two types. One is uh, through a gradual narrowing of blood flow through the artery, through the buildup of calcium. The other is what we call an embolic stroke, which is a sudden blockage of blood flow to an area of the brain. Um, this can be a piece of calcium off of a calcified heart valve uh, or calcium in the carotid arteries or an actual blood clot that comes from the heart. So in terms of strokes overall, if you present to the hospital with a stroke, uh, neurologic symptoms, 87% of the time it's likely to be an ischemic stroke, 13% are hemorrhagic. And uh, it's actually one of the first medical conditions that was uh, identified uh, almost 2,500 years ago. They used the term apoplexy for a non-traumatic brain injury and uh, Hippocrates uh, wrote about it at times. So. Um, we're still evolving the definition as our understanding of the brain tissue and medical imaging gets better. But despite all this, uh, often we can't tell what caused a stroke in most cases. 15 to 40 percent, depending on the study, of ischemic strokes have no identified cause. We can call those a cryptogenic stroke. Now, there's also many strokes which you may hear about, and that's uh, technically a transient ischemic attack. And that's when tissue in the brain has a reduction in the supply of blood and oxygen, but it's not irreversibly injured. So the classic definition for that was a temporary episode of neurologic dysfunction that lasted less than 24 hours. And the caveat was that it left no persistent effect. Although nowadays with the different medications and things we use to treat strokes, you can often have a uh, full infarction and have no persistent effect. So this definition didn't always fit as well so in 2009, they changed that definition um, to include not only affecting the brain, but also the eyes and uh, to be a neurological insult that doesn't have evidence of tissue death by imaging. Uh, they took away the 24 hour um, stipulation because uh, they realized the time isn't as important. But strokes are, are pretty significant. It's a high burden in the US. It's the number five cause of death when taken separately from other cardiovascular disease. So every three minutes, somebody dies a stroke. Um, and uh, the leading cause of death 
uh, sorry, uh, losing cause of disability um, in the U.S., 3% uh, of all males in disability and 2% of all females in disability are on disability due to a stroke. Projections are that by 2030, another 3.4 million adults will have had a stroke. That's 3.9% of the population and unfortunately a 20% increase in prevalence. And in particular, uh, white Hispanic males are at highest uh, risk for increase in that population. The factors that contribute to stroke are kind of interesting. Some of them you have no control over and some of them you do. Uh, one that sort of surprised me uh, in a couple of respects is where you live. Arizona ranks ninth in the country for risk of death from stroke. And I often get nervous when I hear Arizona on these lists in terms of risk and where they fall. And does nine mean we're <laughs> in trouble or does nine mean we're good? Actually in the, uh, the top 10 in terms of the lower numbers. So uh, we did pretty well. Um, it's actually interesting. If you look at the country as a whole, there, there's sadly what they call a stroke belt in the southeastern United States, where you can see how the prevalence of stroke is extremely high. Um, for us in Pima County, we actually do pretty well, and our numbers are relatively low, on par with the uh, Northeast. Other non-modifiable risk factors are your age, unfortunately, uh, your gender, uh, race and ethnicity, and sometimes genetics. Sometimes there's inherited, especially when it comes to hemorrhagic strokes. Um, other factors, lifestyle factors like smoking, diet, inactivity, and drug use, um, those are things we can modify to reduce our stroke risk. And then comorbidities. So uh, high blood pressure is a very, very uh, common one in both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, kidney disease. Uh, there's a larger role being recognized now in uh, sleep apnea in terms of stroke uh, genesis. And uh, with that comes obesity, which can also contribute to diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea. One of the biggest comorbidities we have to deal with is atrial fibrillation and stroke. And that increases the risk of stroke from two to seven times uh, if you take all other risk factors being equal. So, you know, same age, same gender, ethnicity. Um, if you have a history of atrial fibrillation, your risk can be up to seven times higher. Um, there's a large meta-analysis of 50 studies uh, that showed that occult AFib, which means AFib that nobody knew was present, was detected in 24% of patients who had an embolic stroke where the cause wasn't originally identified. And unfortunately, up to 80% of those first AFib episodes were asymptomatic and people didn't know they had them. So we've got this sort of double-edged sword here of a very high risk uh, due to atrial fibrillation and the potential that you might not even know that you have it. So that gets into what atrial fibrillation is and, and the role it plays in stroke genesis. Uh, atrial fibrillation is an abnormal heart rhythm that's triggered by electrical impulses at the top of the heart, which are called the atria. Obviously, uh, there's very high prevalence, and uh, almost all of us probably know somebody with atrial fibrillation. Uh, I'd say about 5.2 million people in the U.S. in 2010. That number is projected to be over 12 million by 2030. Uh, 1.2 million new cases diagnosed per year in 2010, up to 2.6, and uh, likely uh, 700,000 people a year. Uh, who go undiagnosed who have AFib and don't know it. So atrial fibrillation generally starts in the left atrium, but it can start on the right atrium. And there's uh, trigger areas that fire uh, separate from the normal pacemaker of the heart and disrupt your normal signal. Uh, these areas fire and uh, send out electrical wavelets that collide with uh, existing tissue in the heart and scar. And they rotate around and can cause uh, rapid chaotic signals that uh, make the atrium lose its contraction force. And often the, what separates whether or not people know they have atrial fibrillation is how fast the heart rate is. So um, the heart rate can be extremely fast, which tends to be very symptomatic in people. The heart rate can also be extremely slow in different people, which can be symptomatic. Unfortunately, for people who have atrial fibrillation that's conducted in the normal heart rate ranges of about 50 to 100, they're more likely to be the population that doesn't know they have it until it's found accidentally. So these triggers fire, they send off rapid electrical signals, they collide around the atrium, and eventually they take over your normal heart rhythm if left untreated. And here's a little animation uh, from the CDC. So this is the front of the heart, and the role that AFib plays in strokes has to do with that, that 
abnormal contraction. Um, the atria has two structures on the front. They're capacitance structures, meaning they're meant to enlarge when the blood flow to the heart increases. They're sort of extra pockets, if you will. Um, those are called the atrial appendages. Uh, and when we look at a heart um, and are doing anatomy, they, they can actually pick them up and move them. And we, we uh, refer to them as sort of like a dog ear structure, which is where the original name, um, the uh, oracles of the heart for the atria came from, from these structures called the appendages. They're complex and they're uniquely shaped in, in all different people. So, you know, I could look at two different pieces of cauliflower and tell you they're both cauliflower, but they're going to grow different and unique uh, from each one. But here's some CT models that show uh, some, some of the common structures that we see in abnormal appendages. Uh, the left hand segment is looking from the top down and the right hand one is looking straight on at the heart. Um, the appendage is uh, the sort of funny shapes uh, in the right hand view that will be coming straight up at 12 o'clock. Um, so we have very high tech medical names for these structures like chicken wing, windsock and cactus. But uh, basically the, the structure is unique in every individual, um, but there's multiple pockets where blood's able to pour. So the reason that strokes in particular are an issue with atrial fibrillation is the fresh blood from the lungs comes back to the left atrium and uh, gets ready to be pumped out to the rest of your body to, to go to the brain and your other organs. Um, but when the atria is fibrillating and contracting rapidly, uh, the velocity in, of the blood moving slows way down and it actually starts to move in very different and chaotic patterns uh, that causes uh, the uh, blood to stagnate and in some cases form clots. So um, this is actually looking at the flow dynamics of blood in the heart based on different uh, appendages and um, atrial fibrillation versus normal rhythm. And you can see that how chaotically the flow of blood is in atrial fibrillation. So when this happens for any extended period of time, the blood's able to form clots. And unfortunately, those clots um, tend to happen in the front part, that front pocket called the appendage. Uh, that's the site of more than 90% of uh, clots that we find in the heart that eventually form strokes. So here's uh, from the same mapping study, but what's interesting is you can see that the shape of the appendage also predicts how likely you are to have clots form. So this is looking at residual flow after an episode of atrial fibrillation and uh, how much dye gets trapped and doesn't clear the heart in, uh, in this study. I think they used four heartbeats after it went back into normal rhythm to look and see where the blood stagnates. Um, well, in some cases, up to 3% of the blood is trapped in the appendage after an episode of atrial fibrillation. And this is actually an ultrasound. Um, I don't expect anyone to know what these are, but uh, you'll see a, a structure bouncing around inside the black. The black is the um, inside of the atrium. And you can see a clot bouncing there and it's about to cross the valve and go into the ventricle from which point there it'd be ejected out and go to the heart or the eyes, the arms, spleen, kidneys, so AFib through this mechanism is what contributes to most of the strokes, one in seven strokes um, per year. And because of the nature of these, where they're not small pieces of calcium that are um, leaving the carotids, for example, or the valves and going to the brain, they tend to be large, uh, well-formed clots. These strokes tend to be much more severe than, than strokes from other causes. Um, the Veterans Administration actually looked at a study with patients who had no previous diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, but had pacemakers and defibrillators, uh, which act as a sort of ongoing heart monitor. And they found that uh, in those who even had brief episodes of AFib less than five minutes, um, they were at a four to five times uh, increased risk of stroke over time. And that uh, risk is highest in the first five to 10 days after the episode. When they look at patients who have AFib that's discovered accidentally, and this is another study that looked uh, just in people who either pre-op or post-op for surgery um, and atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke can be significant and almost double in some cases. And what's interesting, we see that the risk in non-cardiac surgery is higher than the risk in cardiac surgery. Part of that has to do with the fact that when we do open heart surgery, we often see people have transient episodes of AFib due to inflammation in the heart. Um, so atrial fibrillation that happens after heart surgery is not necessarily felt to be um, always uh, significant. We call that lone AFib. 
Um, but if you're in for knee and you're found to have atrial fibrillation, we can't blame it on the surgery. In many cases, it probably means you have the mechanism for AFib and you may have had it all along and never been diagnosed. And the type of atrial fibrillation you have does matter. Um, persistent atrial fibrillation, which is once atrial fibrillation is ongoing and all the time, puts you at a higher risk than paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is intermittent episodes where people have coming and going sort of AFib. Sometimes they're aware of it, sometimes they're not. And that risk is even higher, even if you're anticoagulated. Uh, there's atrial flutter, which is a more organized atrial arrhythmia, but closely related to AFib, and often the two occur together. So if we see atrial flutter in a patient, uh, we expect they would have a 50% risk of developing atrial fibrillation over the next five years. Um, but even just in atrial flutter and standalone cases, the risk of stroke is two to three times higher. So we would uh, treat your stroke risk the same, regardless of whether it's fibrillation or flutter. And then there's other atrial arrhythmias, and this isn't well understood, but even without documented atrial fibrillation that have a, a, a double risk of stroke, um, some of that is a question of whether or not there's arrhythmias that just aren't documented, or if uh, it has to do with uh, frequent enough arrhythmia that causes some of the same mechanisms as slowing of the blood flow. So the other comorbidities that increase your risk of a stroke from atrial fibrillation are renal dysfunction, uh, congestive heart failure, hypertension, the risk of a stroke uh, due to AFib goes up with your age. So over 65, uh, your risk is up 1% higher. Uh, 75 and up, your risk is uh, double that. Diabetes in particular is another factor that increases your risk of stroke. And unfortunately, even prediabetes, which is a fasting glucose of 110 to 125, uh, can significantly increase the risk of stroke. Having a previous stroke or a TIA um, is pretty significant. So in people who had a TIA only initially, their one-year risk of having a stroke after that TIA was 5%, and their five-year risk of having a stroke was 9.5%. So we often look at TIAs as a warning sign that you have the mechanism there for, for an additional stroke, and it needs to be evaluated, regardless of how transient the episode truly was. Uh, vascular disease like heart disease, uh, Blockages in the carotid arteries, blockages in the legs all contribute to that. Unfortunately, uh, female gender puts you at higher risk. Um, so women have a 20% risk of stroke, lifetime risk of stroke uh, compared to men in the same age range. So to figure out the risk of stroke in a patient, we look at all those comorbidities and the guidelines we use now from American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, um, is what's called the CHADS VAST score, where we add up points, whether you have congestive heart failure, if you have high blood pressure, your age, diabetes or prediabetes, all of these, and it comes up with a, a uh, score that translates to a stroke risk. So for example, if you're a 65-year-old woman with high blood pressure, you have a 3% risk of stroke, um, one point for each um, over the next year without being anticoagulated. So in terms of reducing this risk of stroke, there's a couple of different approaches to take. Um, one is just to prevent the clots from ever forming to begin with. Um, and one avenue for that is trying to detect atrial fibrillation as early as possible. Frequent screening, uh, there's different screening programs. Uh, Apple Watch has an atrial fibrillation screening algorithm on it now. Um, it's much, getting much more common, fortunately, now when people go in for their yearly physical with a primary care doctor to get an EKG done. Um, but an EKG, unfortunately, only gives us a snapshot of what your heart rhythm is in that moment. Um, so prolonged monitoring is also an avenue for us to detect atrial fibrillation. And of course, um, I tell patients uh, a heart monitor sometimes is the best antiarrhythmic medicine there is because we put it on you for a day and nothing happens. Um, so the longer we allow for monitoring time, the uh, increased rate of detection of atrial fibrillation. The other way to prevent uh, stroke and atrial fibrillation is to, to stop the atria from fibrillating to begin with. Um, there's two approaches to that. One is medication, um, and uh, medication can range from anything like beta blockers uh, and calcium channel blockers, which just slow the heart down but don't necessarily stop arrhythmia, to uh, antiarrhythmic drugs like flecainide or amiodarone, which suppress the ability of the atrium to fire rapidly. So those rapid little wavelets that we showed in that other uh, diagram aren't able to perpetuate themselves and the heart eventually will settle back in normal rhythm. Um, 
Um, the important thing to remember with medication is that it suppresses atrial fibrillation, but it doesn't actually cure it or stop it from happening. And unfortunately, the triggers in the heart um, are still present. Uh, you're just using the medicine to, to keep them under control. So often with medication, it's not a matter of the medicine losing effectiveness per se, but uh, the factors in the heart that cause you to go into AFib to begin with are uh, becoming more prevalent. So the next option would be ablation, uh, which we use as a, as a tool to ideally eradicate AFib altogether. And this is just looking at uh, the likelihood of, uh, this is sort of a funny way to look at this, but they call it the freedom from recurrence of AFib. So in this case, the higher the number, the less likely you are to have AFib, be free from AFib, the lower the number, the less likely you are um, to be free from AFib and have more of it. So in this case, the blue line is medication, the red line is ablation, and there's a clear difference in the expected outcome um, using ablation in lieu of medication to reduce the risk of AFib. The other approach um, initially with atrial fibrillation was often just leave it alone, especially if people weren't symptomatic, but uh, given the risk of stroke, and then there was uh, another study out in 2017, I think it was Castle AF, which showed that uh, even in people who have rate controlled atrial fibrillation, it's asymptomatic, the risk of heart failure and mortality actually does go up leaving some in atrial fibrillation. Um, so often if you've been in atrial fibrillation for years, there's not much we can do to stop it, but the sooner we can identify atrial fibrillation and prevent it from happening, uh, the lower mortality and the uh, likelihood of reducing your risk of stroke. So then the other focus would be, you know, if, if we can't prevent, um, you know, we can't detect AFib or you have AFib and we can't stop it, um, the other options are trying to prevent the blood from coalescing uh, to begin with. Um, and the most common way we do that is using medication to prevent these clots from forming. <clears throat> so we use that CHADS VAST scoring tool um, that I showed you earlier, it's based on your risk factors um, to figure out whether or not you're appropriate for anticoagulation. If you have a score of two in a, a man or three in a woman, um, then uh, in that case you would uh, need anticoagulation to reduce your risk of stroke or be indicated by the current guidelines. Um, if, for example, you're a 55-year-old otherwise healthy woman with atrial fibrillation and no other risk factors, you technically have a score of one, um, but in that case, they say it's uh, reasonable to admit anticoagulation therapy because your risk of a um, stroke is about 1% and your risk of, of bleeding is about the same. So when we look at choosing agents, aspirin uh, was one of the ones originally we used to use all the time. It's not even really an anticoagulant per se, it's an antiplatelet agent. Um, and that's really fallen out of favor for a number of reasons. Um, one of the big ones is looking at the rate of stroke um, using aspirin versus using an anticoagulant. So um, in this case, the red line is a higher rate of stroke over time. And the black line is, uh, red line is aspirin and the black line is uh, Eliquis or Pixaban. So you can see there's a significant increase in the rate of stroke using aspirin. The other argument to using aspirin in lieu of a proper oral anticoagulant would be to reduce the risk of bleeding. Um, but actually when you compare the two side by side, it turns out that the rate of bleeding is uh, really not, certainly what we would say clinically significantly higher for an anticoagulant than aspirin. So unfortunately opting to use aspirin for stroke prevention, you're accepting all the risk of bleeding with out really any of the benefit of producing, uh, reducing your rate of stroke. So aspirin's really fallen out of favor, you know, especially the old baby aspirin, which is funny because we call it baby aspirin, but you can't even give it to babies. Uh, it causes rye syndrome. So it's definitely got its place in certain things. Um, you know, we use it for uh, people who've had prior heart attacks, stents, bypass surgery, people who've had strokes due to blocked uh, carotid arteries or carotid artery surgery. But in terms of stroke prevention and AFib, it doesn't really have a role anymore in the modern era. Even people have a risk score of uh, one or zero. The old guidelines used to say to give them aspirin and no longer um, is that recommended. So the old standby uh, outside of aspirin for decades was warfarin um, or Coumadin, uh, which is a very, very potent blood thinner. Um, I didn't realize until looking at this, this uh, Warfarin actually says it's bacon and cheese flavored, which may get 
some more people interested in taking it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so rat, warfarin was literally rat poison, um, is literally rat poison. Um, it's uh, a good anticoagulant. It's very potent. It blocks numerous parts of the clotting cascade. But unfortunately, um, the rate of bleeding on warfarin is considerably higher than the rate of bleeding on the new anticoagulants. And uh, ironically, the rate of stroke in warfarin uh, is actually higher than with the new anticoagulants as well. So, you know, that's sort of the inverse of the aspirin situation where you're accepting more bleeding risk and a higher rate of stroke to take aspirin over the newer medications. So the newer ones, now they use the term, it used to be NOAX, and then they, they realize it looks like you're writing no anticoagulation. They changed that now to DOAX, which stands for direct oral anticoagulants. Pradaxa was the first one to come out. Um, since then, there's been Eliquis, Cervesa, and Zarelto. Um, all of these uh, have a limited effect on the clotting cascade, but in particular, they block uh, clot formation due to stagnation of blood. So um, they have a big role in atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention. Uh, they've subsequently been approved for uh, deep vein thrombosis or DVT prevention in people after surgery, uh, as well as treating blood clots in the lungs. And um, we're seeing that role even expanding now to clotting uh, due to other disorders. Um, and uh, the uh, American Heart Association now calls this a, a class 1A recommendation um, that they're recommended over warfarin. And what that means is um, when we look at the level of evidence and the class of uh, recommendation strength, the level one means this should be done in patients. And the level A that they refer to means that it's very high quality clinical evidence, multiple random control trials. Um, and uh, we're pretty sure on the data in that respect. So, um, they all went through pretty large initial trials to get FDA approval. And uh, since then, there's been multiple post-market studies that have shown that uh, they actually end up being safer even in real-world use than often uh, we see uh, in the original uh, clinical studies. So um, at this point now, you know, they're non-inferior, which is our medical term is saying they're, they weren't worse. And in some cases, they're actually superior to warfarin. Um, and preventing stroke, preventing clotting, and, and lower bleeding rate. And they all now have reversal agents available, which was a big concern for a lot of people. Uh, sort of the idea that you could reverse warfarin through blood transfusions, vitamin K, but we couldn't reverse the new drugs. They all now have reversal agents. Although ironically, um, you see the level of evidence for using reversal agents is lower in these drugs because the bleeding rate is lower. And um, often uh, people don't end up needing them. By the time you stop the medications, the, the bleeding is reversed. So the last kind of option there in terms of preventing the blood from coalescing is to kind of remove that potential space uh, where the clots form and that, that front atrial appendage, that funny looking stalk on the top of the heart. So several devices uh, in development and that are clinically available right now. Um, a is the Watchman device, which is, which is out uh, from Boston Scientific and that's uh, put up through the groin as are the um, amulet and the lariat um, devices to some extent. Um, the Boston Scientific one's the only one out in the market right now, but that's a plug that goes into the left atrial appendage. And generally that's reserved for people who have had a bleeding complication and have either had a, high, a, a prior stroke or high risk of recurrent stroke. And the this um, rationale based on the clinical study was that it's better to use this. It doesn't do as good a job preventing strokes as an oral anticoagulant maybe, but it's better than using nothing. Um, the bottom one, atriclip uh, D, is actually done through an open heart procedure when somebody's having valve surgery or bypass surgery. That's also been very effective. Uh, B and C, the two other devices, are still in development. Um, and we'll see those kind of coming out in the next year or so, presumably. So in terms of preventing uh, strokes, sort of the future is looking at um, now, because the oral anticoagulants work pretty well, they have a short off and on time. Um, looking at atrial fibrillation, ablation, plus monitoring and using anticoagulation as needed. There's five clinical trials right now going on to evaluate that. Um, the other is doing AFib ablation with uh, left atrial appendage occlusion, just de facto at the time of the procedure, including left atrial appendage. There's some thought that not only does that prevent stroke, but that also prevents uh, AFib coming back in certain cases. And uh, we have a clinical trial that's just starting at TMC uh, now uh, for elective left atrial appendage occlusion. Um, 
So as I said earlier, the criteria right now is you had to have had a bleeding complication and a stroke or extremely high risk of stroke. Uh, this study is looking at people electively who'd like to have the left atrial appendage occluded um, without taking an anticoagulant or having a prior history of bleeding to then compare over time the, the rate of stroke in these populations. So at that point, I'll leave it open for questions, I guess, and uh, go from there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. I do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one is, can the first symptom of a atrial fibrillation be a stroke? Would you know about it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, oftentimes um, the tricky part is that in, in, in that VA study, it talked uh, to that a little bit that the rate of stroke after an episode of AFib, even if it's short, occurred, was highest at the five to 10 day mark after the event happened. And some of the rationale to that is that the clot forms in the appendage and then it just hangs out there and uh, there's low flow, continues to amass more blood cells to it. Um, and then you're back in normal rhythm for a while and it eventually rocks loose and falls downstream. They have this little animation I used to put up of uh, the ice caps going over Niagara Falls, but basically that same notion, it eventually just breaks loose. So um, you can come into the hospital and present with a stroke and your EKG is totally normal. And unfortunately, that's where we have to use the prolonged monitoring to figure out if you're having atrial fibrillation that would explain this, the clot. Okay, so somebody may not know that they have that they've been in AFib. Well, at, yeah, at many, many of them. Time, right? Yeah, I think it was. Um, I think it was twenty four percent in that one study that was found of atrial fibrillation after because of monitoring because they had a stroke that we couldn't. Okay, we couldn't all right. And yeah. is it ideal to start medications and if that doesn't work, then do an ablation? It used to be initially when we first started doing AFib ablation in the early 2000s, the recommendation was to try multiple drugs. And then we, um, if that didn't work, they would call that drug resistant atrial fibrillation, then do ablation. And ablation's gotten better. The tools have gotten better. It's safer. Um, over time. So then it changed to try one drug. And then if that one drug didn't work, then consider ablation. Um, now the newest set of guidelines, I think from 2017, so you can use ablation as a first line therapy. You don't have to even have ever tried a drug. And um, they also took out, based on Castle AF, if it's not out yet, it will be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be proven to be symptomatic atrial fibrillation. You can have atrial fibrillation um, that doesn't necessarily bother you, but see on an EKG and that's a reason to get an ablation. Okay, now here's a follow-up about ablations. Can you hmm. explain what exactly is an ablation and how <laughs> to cure it? Could somebody just ask that? <laughs> yeah, how much time do you have? Um, what, the, the, the way we're doing ablations now, I guess I'll go with kind of the modern and we can work back, but um, on uh, the one slide, um, actually, let me just shoot back here real okay. quick. Okay. Um, are you guys still able to see the slides? Yep. Um, okay. So there's uh, trigger points, and some are identified just based on anatomy, and others we have to map out and see. But um, these kind of green and blue areas I highlighted here, which are common triggers that cause a fib to fire. And as you see, they're actually, uh, most of them are actually outside of the heart, on the surface of the heart, and going to the lungs. Um, so ablation initially was uh, involved going into those veins and trying to cauterize, but you can damage the tissue. Um, so now what we do is what's called pulmonary vein isolation, where we used to use cautery, now we use a balloon to freeze it, but basically you create a, a line around uh, those veins so that if they do trigger and fire, the signal can't escape and affect your normal rhythm. And that's all done through the groin. There is a version that originally started with open heart surgery. Um, there's still what's called a maze procedure, which is what ablation is actually modeled after. And some people, when they have bypass surgery, or valve surgery, will get a maze if they have a history of atrial fibrillation at the time. They've got the hood open on the car, but uh, otherwise we do it through through catheters in the groin. And is that an outpatient procedure, or is that something that you would be inpatient after you had an ablation? Yeah, it's outpatient. It's done under general anesthesia. Um, when we first did AFib ablations, they would be hours. They'd be you know, four, six, eight hours, depending on how many trigger sites there were and um, how much scar. Um, nowadays, with the balloon, they're half hour to 45 minutes in some cases. Okay, great. Now, I had another question just came in about heart ablations as well. Somebody had a heart ablation in 2009 and didn't try any meds first. She just wants to know how she can tell if she still has AFib. Uh, 
Um, you know, first thing is an EKG, just a, just a standard old 10 second EKG to look and see what you're in right now. Um, the other is through prolonged monitoring, you know, going and wearing a monitor for, we do anywhere from a one day to 30 days for people. Uh, we even have implanted heart monitors the last two to three years we can put under the skin. So they constantly monitor and they would sort of radio out um, an alert to your cardiologist to let them know that you're having episodes of AFib, which are great for people who we're, we're using that more and more. And, and uh, that's one of those things in sort of the future avenues where um, people who've had AFib in the past. So you're, you would look at their stroke risk based on that Chaz VAS score and say, well, your risk of stroke is very high, but then they've had an ablation and no AFib that they know of for years after. Um, so in that case, we're using the monitoring um, to sort of alert us to whether or not, you know, they're having any AFib at all. And if they are, how much and how long is it lasting? And, and in some cases, not all, um, having people get off their blood thinners um, okay. using a monitor. So, and now there's yeah. Apple Watch and all kinds of cool things out there. Right, <laughs> exactly. There sure are. Here's um, another one. Lot. Yeah. I had another question asking about um, the relationship between sleep apnea and AFib. Is there, is that, yes. you know, yeah. if you have sleep apnea, is that going to, do you have a higher chance of having yeah that? it's it's a real evolving area study um not for some people there have been people who have been beating the drum for years on that that if you have um, sleep apnea it's going to lead atrial fibrillation and and more and more studies bear that out and it also is a two-way street there are people who have atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation can lead to other kinds of obstructive uh you know sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing things like that um but in terms of when we talk to patients about modifiable risk factors, that's a, that's a huge one. Um, and we're, we're working more and more on screening people for that. And there's help. Thankfully there's things other than a mask now for sleep apnea. There's, there's kind of devices and things coming out. Cause I have plenty of people who will tell, tell me they don't even want the test cause they don't want to consider wearing a mask. They won't do it. Um, you know, and, but unfortunately we could tell you, you know, you have a 10 to 20% higher chance of AFib coming back after ablation. If you have sleep apnea, you don't treat it. Example. That's right. Excellent. Okay. If you go ahead and put up the uh, phone number for Pima Heart and Vascular, um, you'll see it on your screen there. It is 520-838-3540. Uh, so if you are interested in an appointment with Pima Heart and Vascular, please give please give that number a call. Um, and I think I've answered, we've answered all the questions. Thank you so much, great. Mike. That was, that was great. It was a great overview um, of how important it is to really look at the, you know, that relationship between AFib and stroke. So we appreciate you being here today. Um, we do have another presentation tomorrow if you are interested in joining us. Um, it will be the importance of socialization for brain fitness. Um, at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, March 23rd. So we hope to see you then. Thank, thank you again, Mike. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.